Hello guys, I'm Kevin Kevich and this is Kevin's Disobedience. And I thought today we would talk about winter tree identification. And that's mostly going to be talking about bark and how to determine the difference between the hardwoods based on the bark alone. Though there are a few other tricks you can use that will help you determine what uh, you're looking at if you're unsure that is not merely about the bark. So let's dig in, shall we? So probably the easiest tree to identify by its bark, if you have any, are honey locusts. Um, not all locusts carry these gnarly thorns, but honey locusts do, and you won't mistake it for any other tree. So honey locusts aside, I think you should start with black walnut and black cherry because the color stands out in the woods so easily. Walnut is another one, especially in mature forms. It's easy for young kids to identify or for beginners because it has a really pronounced brownish gray bark. Almost looks like armor all the way up. So at first you might think that walnut looks like cherry, but it just doesn't look anything like it in person. Walnut, especially when mature, has these really distinct, almost block-like armor uh, on the bark. And cherry is much more narrow. Let me show you. So you see how thick the walnut is? I mean, this is a good two inches thick. Of course, this is a mature walnut tree. But let me go show you a mature cherry tree and I'll show you the difference. Here's a mature cherry, even bigger than that walnut. And you can see that the uh, bark isn't nearly as deep, you know, maybe an inch. And this is really mature, um, just a different bark. And once you, once someone points it out to you, you'll always see it. They are similar in color, similar, but different. The cherries in this area, they tend to grow tall and spindly. They're easy to see because of their dark reddish bark, but they suffer from this heart rot a lot. You don't see too many mature ones unless they're in the right condition. When I say mature, they can get quite big, but they don't live hundreds of years. So another easy two trees you can identify their bark are the hackberry and then right behind me is a red oak. I'll get you a clearer picture of the red oak, but it's easy to identify by its bark too. Pretty much all trees are once you become familiar with what you have in the area, but some are easier than the novice and the hackberry is easy because it has that scaly like, almost. I thought it was looked like bugs crawling up a tree when I was a kid. And the red oak has the classic ski slope pattern. You can just see that white ski slope like pattern on red oaks very easily. And you want to distinguish between the two main categories of oak. That's white oak and red oak. And it's very easy to do that by the bark once you know what you're looking at. Red oak, white oak. We have a red oak and a white oak right next to each other. And you can see how much smoother the bark is on the red oak. You can see those distinct ski slope white lines. So here's a nice healthy stick of red oak. You can easily see those distinct ski slopes coming down the tree. And the white oak has much more of a shaggy bark that sheds off on the sides. Now here are two younger white oak. And keep in mind that red oak, which we have one back there, Red oak and white oak are just two broad categories. There are many different kinds of each. And you can see that these two white oak already have that distinct armor-like bark on them, even in this phase. Also, unlike most other trees, some white oaks hold their leaves all winter long. So for you regular watchers of my channel, you will know that when I was younger, I dubbed this old white oak. The tree of Terabithia. I have no idea how old this thing is. Old. Still got some of its leaves there. And it's got a massive 
burl on it. Big bulbous burl. I think that's supposed to be the quintessential pot leaf, but they're missing two leaves there. Come on guys, learn your plants. <laughs> Beech is another super easy tree to identify by the bark. Maybe the easiest after the honey locust because it's so smooth and canvas-like. You'll probably want to pull out the old pocket knife and carve on it, but let's not. It's better off if you don't do this. Though it, it doesn't kill the tree in most cases unless you really wrap the graffiti all the way around, uh, touching itself in a big band. That's actually how the early colonists used to kill big trees. There's a term for it, I forget, but they used to band it around the bark so it couldn't send up sap and over time it would just die. So there's some beech scattered in among the cherry and oak here. You can see in the background there that beech often hold their leaves through the winter like white oak. And you'll be attracted to beech bark if you're a young man or just a naughty man with a knife because you'll want to carve into these. They're just like the perfect canvas for carving, especially big mature ones because it's a real smooth white skin. So you'll often see graffiti on it. I don't have a lot of these on my place. This is on my cousin's place. These are sycamore easy to identify because they get very, very big, especially next to waterways. But their flakes, or their bark, also flakes off. So I'm down here at my local park, just crossing the covered bridge here. I want to show you guys this massive sycamore right when you come into the park. You can see there. That's what I'm talking about, bone white against the sky. Look at that girl. Always just look like winter camouflage to me. Just walking back to the car here and you can see that the sycamores just love hugging the creek. They love running water. So this is another one that's really easy to identify by its bark. This is the shag bark hickory. You can see it's just flaking off. It almost looks like something's wrong with it. It looks really cool, especially when they get this big. I like these guys. They prefer to grow tall and strong. And they have the open space here to do that now. And they will. These guys will get 150, 200 feet if you let them. So with ash, you want to look for this distinct diamond shape in the bark. But honestly, around here nowadays, it's easier to just look for the holes. Perfect example. So I saw this the other day, but this is a very mature ash, just like the other one I just showed you. And last year, it didn't have the bugs. This year, as you can clearly see, it does. So this tree is on its way to the graveyard. I've said it before. And I'll say it again, if you're not aware, but much of this area, um, certainly Western Pennsylvania, has been ravished by these emerald boring beetles. And while I do still see some mature and young ash trees around, they get into these really quick. So the only thing you could really mistake with a ash tree around here is maybe a smaller locust. But locust bark is really, really gnarly. And these artist conchs really prefer this. So if you see this artist conch, doesn't mean it is going to be an ash. I've seen them on cherry and stuff, but they really love the locust. So the only thing you might get locusts confused with is Osage orange. But you can see here that it has a distinct orange color in the tree. And if it has its seed ball on the tree, you'll know you're looking at an Osage. There's a, an old wives tale about those Osage, we used to call them monkey balls. And that's if they keep spiders out of your basement. They don't, I was told that by an old lady. And my dad put some in our basement when we were young and I can tell you, they don't work.
So elm can be a little tricky at first, especially because of the Dutch elm disease. Elms are no longer the great dooryard trees of our ancestors. Both elms and chestnuts used to be abundant in the forest scape, but they're only present in small examples. But there are two really easy ways that I use to determine whether it, you're looking at an elm or not. I'll share those with you right now. I don't know what the technical term for this is, but these suckers that they send off down here lower on the tree, and then especially on saplings or younger trees, they have this spongy bark. And you can tell the difference between um, slippery elm and American elm, but let's not go into that for a beginner video. Here's another little clump of elms growing together. And again, I think you can see how spongy that is. So right there is a mature Ohio Buckeye. I, th I found one on the ground the other day. I was looking through the snow to see if it had dropped some this year and it had. I don't know if the camera will communicate it, but they have a really white grayish bark. So you'll probably notice I didn't include any birch in this video. And that's because all the birch in my area are ornamental so i'm not going to speak on it because i don't have um much experience identifying birch but it's it's easy to do when you know what they look like the only thing you might confuse birch for is beach and once you know what beach looks like you won't confuse it for birch so of course these are not all the trees in the world not by a long shot i left off many common softwoods like poplar and aspen and willow largely because they don't grow around here very much i do have a few tulip poplars on the property and a few willow and if you go further north you'll see some cedar and we do have some white pine and spruce around though those are largely imported as monocrops so i'll touch on them briefly but mostly I'm touching on what is local and what is common. All right, I'm not really gonna include conifers in this winter ID because they always carry their needles and it's easier to determine by their needles than it is their bark. But the easiest way to determine the difference between spruce and white pine is spruce hang their branches out and then hang their needles down, whereas pine is the other way. Here's some white pine right here. You can see how they have very similar swooping branches as spruce, but they don't, their needles don't hang down. They shoot up. The needles are very different as well, but that's not what this video is about. It's about bark. <laughs> so this might not come out on camera in this light, but I think the easiest way to learn maple is kind of to learn it in contrast to all the other trees in the forest. They'll just stand out as smoother bark when they're young, especially compared to the others. Like you can see there's white oak and there's a big red oak back there, but all the maples stand out, at least to my eye, as much smoother trees. Here's a great example right here, I think. So we got a maple and you can see while it's smooth, compared to most barks in the forest. We have a beach right behind, and you can see how much smoother a beach is. So with the exception of beach, maple is just gonna stand out as one of the smoother barks in the forest, especially when they're young. One of the more frustrating things, especially when you're getting started, is trees in different maturity states can look very different. Like right behind me here, we have a very mature white oak and you can see that it doesn't look like that flaky bark that younger trees have, especially down here on the base. It's a much more mature, almost armor-like um, bark, and it's very thick. So that can be frustrating, but it's just something that you have to learn by looking at trees in different seasons and having somebody point out the different maturity levels of trees. Again, keep in mind, I'm a self-taught naturalist, so anything I know is through first-hand experience, or much of what I know is through first-hand experience, and that's not the easiest way to learn. It's much easier if you can walk around the woods with somebody and have them point at the trees and tell you what's what and why, and that's how I would recommend you learn, but 
clearly you can learn in other ways. And I'll share some of those with you uh, in this video. Today, that largely means getting the right apps on your phone, but there are also some useful books I'll share at the end. So suffice it to say, I am not an expert, and if I say anything in this video that is wrong or inaccurate, I'm happy to be wrong. And please correct me in the doobly-doo below. That's how we learn, that's how we communicate. Just be nice, I appreciate it, and thank you. Well, I hope that was both entertaining and informative for you. I'm just gonna walk out of here now, but I wanted to end the video by saying there are some apps and books that I wanna make you aware of, and I'll link those in the description below. But generally speaking, you want books that are on whatever it is you're trying to identify, in this case, trees or mushrooms or plants, on as close to your area as you can get. So the more specific to your location, the better the book's going to be. And I got a great one if you live in Pennsylvania. This guy has dedicated his life to knowing the trees. And you can really geek out on everything there is to know about every tree and every um, species in that, genre, or in that genus. But more specifically, the easiest way to get a quick ID now is through some apps. So I've been wanting apps like this for years, and the ones that I use are actually uh, pay apps, but I think they're well worth it. They're like 10 bucks a year or something. Um, and that's Picture This, which is your general plan ID. Then there's Picture Mushroom and there's Picture Insect. And I have all three of them on my phone and they almost never let me down. Now, it's not the only way you wanna ID something if you're gonna eat it, like in the case of mushrooms, but it's a good place to start and I'll link those in the description as well. And I'll link my other video that talks about learning the word of a plant or the word of a tree or the specific um, word it, that would enable you to see something in more detail. And that didn't get as much attention as I had hoped. I was doing a silly little thing with the um, this scanner darkly filter, which I thought was cool, but probably a mistake. Anyway, guys, hope you enjoyed it. I'll see you on the next one. Stay safe. Get outside.